My sermon this morning is entitled, A Joyful Christmas, and for a text, I'm looking at Luke chapter 1, verses 39 to 56, and uh, Pastor Ray and I will work together on this uh, passage. Pastor Ray will start on the odd-numbered verses, and I'll do the even-numbered. Pastor Ray, would you please begin? Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to the city of Judah. And entered uh, the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the fruit of your womb. But why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed, for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. And my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of this maidservant, and behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, he hath scattered the proud in the imaginations of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his seed forever. And Mary remained with her about three months, and returned to her house. Amen. There's great power in anticipation. It's built into our hearts, our nature. We need to have something to look forward to. It's the way we are. Walking into a restaurant, there's joy on the faces. And when we come out a little later, <laughs> well, uh, the word satiation comes to mind. We just are filled. But um, I call it recreational food. <laughs> but uh, we feel joyful about getting a new car. Uh, housewife is joyful about remodeling. I, my wife is elated. She just loves it when everything gets torn up. I can't figure it out. <laughs> when you think about it, life in, in itself is in a series of anticipated joys. At night, you go to bed anticipating a new morning and a new day and new opportunities. Uh, you look uh, forward to three meals. I know I do. <laughs> Maybe too much. Three meals a day. <laughs> On the job, we look forward to breaks, lunches, and punch-out time. <laughs> That's right. And, and, and uh, we, um, we look forward to vacations, weekends, and how many of you know what TGIF means? Thank God it's Friday. We look forward to these things. School or college kids, they look forward to Christmas or spring breaks. It's true. And grandparents, we look forward to... Uh, bouncing a little kid on our knee that's right well that's our job that's our job a woman looks forward to the birth of her child that's what today's text is about and and uh, I remember very well the joyful anticipation of becoming a pastor we sold our house uh, not too far from LAX in Southern California we um, we bought a place out in Orange County 
and moved to that new community 40 miles away and I enrolled in a Bible school which I went to in the evening still worked full-time dailies uh, every day um, great joy as we made all these changes because we had a goal we were gonna move where God was leading us amen and um, the, our goal was a pastoral care I always envisioned a small rural community church and God gave us what we uh, our, I'm, I'm going to call it faith imagination. And, and it was located at the place that God was, was leading us. It was almost a letdown three and a half years after enrollment when the registrar came to me and said, Phil, I think we got enough credits for you to graduate. Uh, you, you see, there was this still great joy preparing for what was ahead. It was the joy of anticipation. Now, my, uh, Mary was told by the angel that she was going uh, to uh, bear this long-awaited I mean they've been waiting for centuries for Messiah the prophets had been talking about it over and over and uh, the uh, joy of anticipation amen uh, she was to bear this long-awaited Messiah uh, incidentally the Aramaic word for that is Yeshua I've had uh, Hebrew people, Hebrew Christians, uh, Messianics, will correct me. And they'll say, Phil, the name is Yeshua, not Jesus. Okay. <laughs> I, we still know who he is, don't we? Amen. But uh, the angel of the Lord revealed to her the nature of this special son. And, and uh, I'm reading from Luke 135, and the angel answered her and said, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One, which is to be born, will be called the Son of God. Awesome, awesome. So, my sermon this morning is about anticipated joy. Now, all of you ladies in the room knew what, know what I'm talking about. We're talking about anticipation of the birth of a child and uh, what about the joy in Mary's heart as she anticipated the birth of this special son I'm sure that her joy was heightened by that message given by the angel <laughs> take a look at your outline that we've given you today there are more than 300 Old Testament scriptures and prophecies that are telling us about the birth of Messiah and uh, mankind and even the whole of creation groaned and labored until the arrival of this special baby unlike anyone ever born before or as since or after and there's never been anything like him it was a cause for great joy so don't grieve the uh, Nehemiah says for the joy of the Lord is your strength say that with me please the joy of the Lord is your strength amen it's my strength amen praise God for, and, and, and then we're reminded uh, about joy again in Romans chapter 14, 17, when people are asking, well, what is the kingdom of God? You're talking about, Jesus talked about it all the time. The kingdom of God, Paul says, is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy. There's that joy word again, and the Holy Spirit. And, and the prophet Habakkuk, in, in chapter 3 and verse 18, he said, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Amen. And of course there's that wonderful mental health passage in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Amen. The, the Greek word for, uh, for, for joy is kara. Uh, I'm using a, it's called a guttural. Kara, kara. We all, a lot of times people will use a K for that, but that's English. But anyway, and, and uh, it's the root word uh, that means essentially joy. Now if you add a, a, a ris at the end of kara, kares, then you end up with the word grace or kindness. If you translate it grace in, in, in the New Testament. And then if you get to the term charisma, uh, I've used the word grace here again, but the, the word is really gifts. Uh, it has to do with uh, gifts. Uh, chara You've heard the term charismatic. These are people that believe the gifts of the Spirit are still around. And, and all you have to do is read Christian history to know that they, they never ceased. Amen. So joy is a major theme of the New Testament when you think about it. And I'd, I've noticed here, I, I'm not very good at counting. I'll let somebody else count this for me. <laughs> 63 times in the New Testament, 
uh, the word uh, joy appears. And the word rejoice is 77 times. Wow. I'm sorry. That's uh, Yeah, that is. A, yeah, those are New Testament words. Okay. And counting. Now, there are three major reasons for joy that we'll find in this text. Uh, the first one is we read those those verses that uh, we just read Pastor Ray and I. They, uh, Elizabeth's song involves prophecy and praise. And in verse 42, would you read that with me, please? Then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Now, Elizabeth is filled with the Holy Spirit, and being filled with God's Spirit, she speaks forth a blessing. And she blesses Mary, just blesses her. Now, if think about it now, she is the aunt of Mary, and, and she has a child in her womb, which is John the Baptist to be. And when he's born, it's what he's going to become. And, and um, uh, she is um, the niece aunt and niece it's interesting and mary here has conceived a child and is just uh, that is just getting started so elizabeth bears witness uh, from from john uh, from the infant john that because that, that leaping of the child in the womb um in uh, and, and luke 144 for indeed as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears the babe le le leaped in my womb now Notice that Elizabeth didn't say the fetus le leaped in my womb or didn't call it as I've heard some of these terrible people that, that believe in, in, in infant killing. Um, uh, it's an unwanted parasite. She, she uses a respectful term for a child. A newly conceived infant in a mother's womb is a child. And uh, this morning, coincidentally to my sermon, I, t I, I sometimes will do this when I'm having a uh, 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 morning breakfast. I turned on uh, Crossing Paths. Don Reed, did you hear that testimony this morning on Don Reed's uh, Crossing Paths broadcast? They had a doctor, Teh, T-E-H, uh, who is a gynecological physician from, uh, uh, from uh, Jameson Hospital in Newcastle. And uh, he... Uh, uh, was talking about how that even when he was in his internship and he was asked to uh, uh, take an internship out there in Akron and when that was finished uh, he was asked uh, by an abortion doctor if he had performed ab abortions and uh, it was kind of frightening uh, that, that guy was was killing 15 babies a day with that thing I, I don't believe in abortion and I hate what the, has happened to this country about that and the, the doctor wasn't even a believer yet, but he said, I can't take it. He said one time he was, and this, this one brought me to tears listening to his testimony. One time there was a child that was dead in its mother's womb, and he had to vacuum it out. And he described what happened and what he saw, you know. And he could not understand how anyone would take a living child from a mother's womb and, and with that heart, little heart still beating. I mean... It was it was tears. I mean, the guy has so much passion. He wasn't even a believer yet. He didn't become a believer until 1990. He started his his actual service uh, in in Newcastle area in in 1990. But uh, what a man! He's retired now. But what a testimony of um, uh, here's a man who just had this compassion. Uh, that, that's the kind of guy I would like my the ladies in my household to be treated by somebody like that amen yes oh i loved him oh, oh you knew him oh what what a man i just i just cried when i listened to his testimony oh he's a beautiful man you can see why it's the presence of the lord plus he had a, a, a he definitely had a call into the the business of being a physician what a what a guy notice that uh, um the Koine Greek word here is brifos, which means unborn child. Doesn't call it a fetus. Um, I'm, I'm just really irritated about what's been going on for the since Roe versus Wade in 1972. This this country is sick. Elizabeth prophesies over Mary, her niece, and and uh, I've got a, a passage here that's interesting. Blessed is she 
who believed, that's what Elizabeth's blessing is in prophecy, and for there will be a fulfillment of those things which she told, were told her from the Lord. And then I'm just quoting uh, Joel 2.28, because I think this is significant. Uh, and it came to pass, shall come to pass afterward, thou wilt pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons and daughters, hello, shall prophesy. Okay. And your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall, shall see visions. Now, women in Elizabeth's time, you've got to understand how revolutionary this is. Uh, they weren't allowed to read or write Hebrew. It was only for the males. Uh, women couldn't sit with their husbands or, or sons in the synagogue. The, the guys sat on one side with a partition and the women on the other. They weren't allowed to speak in the synagogue. Yes. Oh, it makes me want to throw up. Yeah, it really is. I've, I actually have heard these people that are proponents of Roe versus Wade actually use that terminology. I wouldn't bring that up unless they... That's disgusting. Unwanted parasite. Okay. And, and women weren't allowed to speak in the synagogue. Uh, they, they called it bar mitzvah when a young fellow reaches 12. You know, Jesus went through his bar mitzvah. And they're, allow, they're supposed to read from the... And Hebrew from the scroll, and and there to uh, answer questions of the scholars there, uh, it was unheard of for a woman to prophesy. Absolutely unheard of, and unheard of for a woman to presume to speak for the Lord. If you look at all the Old Testament prophets, who are they? They're all men. <laughs> this, this is this, so. That's the first occasion for joy. Is Elizabeth's song of prophecy and praise. I love it. The second reason for joy in this text is Mary's song of praise. Now, uh, it's called the Magnificat, and I'm going to explain what that means in a minute, in verses 46 to 45. Now, Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior, for he has regarded the lowly estate of his maidservant, and behold, his forth all generations will call me blessed. Now, Mary's praise of the Lord is called the Magnificat because it is Latin. And that's where we get the word from Latin. Uh, early Christianity used that particularly. Uh, Magnificat anima mea dominium. And uh, my soul magnifies the Lord. That's what it means in, in English. So, out of this, this is one of the earliest ancient hymns in Christianity. Let me, let me, we're talking between the, the, the book of Acts and the, and the uh, uh, century number one, okay, uh, finishing up in, in the second century. Now, um, what do you think the oldest hymn in Christendom is? Does anybody know? We even know the tune of it. Do you know what it is? Uh, <laughs> it sounds like that, but that one goes to the 16th century, but that's a good point. Uh, we've got... Uh, Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Now that is the oldest song in Christendom. And, uh, but, but the Magnificat, for 1,500 years, it was picked up really strongly in the 5th century of Christianity. And they sang it all the way through the years. It's also called the Canticle. Canticle. The Canticle is, uh, means song in, in Latin. And it's the song of Mary. And it was uh, amazing. Now Mary's joy was rooted in the Lord's choosing her. You see, God doesn't always choose a beautiful, exalted woman. I see them all the time patting each other on the back. You ever notice that? A lot of those TV shows that are popular, uh, we'll see the ladies all patting each other on the back and, and how wonderful they are. <laughs> I, I can't help it. it. It's That's not it. The real exaltation is coming from God himself, and Mary was recognizing this. Uh, God doesn't choose a wealthy or prominent woman. He doesn't choose a socially, oh, she's a socially prominent person. Oh, give, give me a break. But he chooses common, a common, plain Jewish girl. She's unmarried, never been with a man. He, ch he still chooses ordinary women with pure hearts. Amen. I believe that. So Mary was the key to the incarnation. Incidentally, that, that's another word that has to do with carne. That's a, that's a Latin word again, meaning in flesh. Uh, you know, you've heard the word carnivore. That's because it's a flesh eater. Okay, so here is God pouring himself into human flesh. Amazing. 
So, the Holy Spirit, uh, God, Mary gave a, him flesh, when you think about it, and the blood was through the, the breath of God, the Holy Spirit, that conceived in her womb, Jesus. So, you might say that the Holy Spirit gave him the very spirit of the very God. Amen. That's another reason for joy in this text. And the third one uh, is a reason for joy is we joyfully anticipate his second coming. And, and uh, in Titus chapter 2 and verse 13, would you read that with me please? Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay, so the Aramaic term here, and it's interesting, is Maranatha. Can you say that with me, please? Maranatha. It's a, it's a great word. It means the Lord comes in Aramaic. Okay, now the term occurs in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, where it ends with Maranatha. And uh, the term also uh, carries with it the longing of every believer. We keep saying, Lord, we've had enough of this world. We've had enough of this suffering. We've had enough of this sin. We've had enough of this darkness and blackness. Come quickly. Come. And Christians for all the millennia have, cr have cried out Maranatha, meaning that their longing is for the end of all of this, so that he can come and establish his kingdom. He will do it. It will happen. <clears throat> Paul reminds us that we presently live in temporary bodies. How many of you understand what a tent is? compared with a building <laughs> well my tent is getting a little shabby it's getting a little worn on the top <laughs> you get my point <laughs> it's wearing out that's not the only thing on me that's wearing out brother Dave knows what I'm talking about we've been comparing notes ourselves we commiserate about it but it's true we're not here this body is not made to last forever and 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 uh, in, in Philippians chapter 3, I like verses 20 to 21. I'm, I've got them written there for you. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that is um, <clears throat> may be it, that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the, the working by which he is able to subdue all things to himself conform to his glorious body. Paul, uh, John the Beloved, he says, it does not even appear as how we shall be when he appears, but we know this, we shall be like him. And so I read that in a post-resurrection appearance of Jesus. He was able to eat food. He could be touched and felt. He could be recognized. Will I recognize my loved ones in heaven? Well, John thought so. He said yes. I believe that. <coughs> So the word Advent is where, that's why we have two candles, because we're in the second week of anticipating the birth of Christ. And it, 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 the word Advent is derived from another Latin word again, which means Adventus. And that's the actual word translated uh, into English, or it's literally what we call transliterated in English, Advent. Uh, and it means the coming or arrival of someone or something special. Amen. <clears throat> Remember the traditional song, Come, O Come, Emmanuel? Amen. Then, then there's the uh, joyful expression, Maranatha, that was used in the early church. Now, here's another one of the uh, earliest documents of the church. Before people were, they were actually writing and getting the, the writings of the apostles circulated, there was something called the Didache. Uh, the, the word Didache is the Greek again, and it means, has to do with uh, teaching. Okay. And, and it was the teaching, the earliest teaching <clears throat> that was circulating among the churches of the 12 apostles. And, and here we have, I'm quoting a, a, a chapter and a verse from the, the Didache. <clears throat> may your grace come, this world, and may this world pass away. Hosanna to the God of David. If anyone is holy, let him approach the Lord's Supper or Eucharist. If anyone is not, let him repent, Maranatha. Amen. So, Maranatha, come Lord, compares with the Lord's Prayer. Here's another interesting comparison. <clears throat> Remember in the, in the Lord's Prayer you say, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. I've got it reproduced here. John 11, uh, verses uh, 1, 
D, the last half of the verse, to two, verse 2. One of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. And so he said to them, when you pray, say. Now, would you read this with me, please? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know what you're saying when you pray that? Your kingdom come? Maranatha. Same thing. We are praying, Lord, send your son. That's what Maranatha is really meaning. To reign over us as the king and lord of all. And we pray that you come and redeem us from sin and death in the grave. Come, Lord, and make all things new. And we joyfully anticipate the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ this Advent season. <clears throat> when you were a child, you could hardly wait to open your presents. We got a big one coming. Eye has not seen, nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of men, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Man, there's a big present coming. The minute I close my eyes and draw my last breath in this life, I can open my gift. Amen. At Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, bless this message. I pray for every person, Lord, that needs some joy in this Christmas. Father, that they would find their joy in Jesus, just like we said last week, to find their peace in Jesus. We love you, Lord. Bless these words in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.